By now, you've probably become aware of this new My Little Pony craze that's been sweeping the internet. Well, according to Meme.com, there's so much material now, it's officially reached the status of subculture. Naturally, people are a little apprehensive or weirded out. My Little Pony has always been synonymous with little girls. That is until the runaway hit My Little Pony Friendship is Magic premiered. Then there was this huge spike in older fans, including males ranging from all walks of life. And yes, if it hasn't been too obvious, I'm a fan of the show for a number of reasons. And I do have an episode plan that features a very special character. But I'm not ready to do that yet. But in the meantime, I might as well address the many comments I've gotten to explain why I like this show so much. And since the season premiere is in a week, I decided to do a little retrospective on My Little Pony mainly from the male perspective, in hopes to set a foundation for those future reviews and to see just how we all got here. It's 1981, and Hasbro debuts its My Little Pony toy line, created by designer Bonnie Zacherly. Little plastic horses with cute little butt tattoos and brushable hair that felt like steel wool when your lummox of an older cousin would hold you down and shove one right in your face were a huge commercial success. And like every toy line back then, it was eventually adapted to animation. Now, I was born in 1985, and from that point on, I was basically raised by television. My favorite movies were Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, Winnie the Pooh, and Mary Poppins. But by the time I was three, I discovered that there were more than just three black boxes in the world. They even had a whole section just for kids, so I didn't just have to randomly search for stuff on TV. Yeah, I knew how to use the remote when I was three, but I didn't know how time worked. I thought it had something to do with magnets back then. The point is, I love cartoons and watched as many as I could when I could. And sometimes that included the girl stuff when nothing else was available. Now to jumpstart your memory, My Little Pony was about these colorful little creatures living peacefully in a place called Dream Valley. They are joined by Megan, an analog human character that little girls were meant to identify with. Yeah, the ponies had shallow personalities, Megan was about as interesting as a bowl of watered-down oatmeal, and nothing was ever explained. Hop on! Uh, you, you do know how to ride, I hope. Of course I know how to ride! Wait! Hey, where are we going? To help my friends! They need you! Me? What can I do? You're strong! No, I'm not! You can fight! No, I can't! Listen. If you have a better criteria for Messiah other than the first person you see in the 5 to 14 year old female demographic, then I'd like to hear it. But I gotta say, as a boy, I like the villains. For some reason, every other weekend was freaking Ragnarok in Ponyland, with some big baddie trying to enslave the ponies, steal some magical artifact, or wipe everything off the map so they could just take over the world. Of course! God, I miss 80s villains. Yeah, complex, sympathetic villains are always excellent when done right, but sometimes the simpler the motives, the more terrifying the villain. In the very first TV special, you had T-Rack, a giant half-minotaur, half-centaur, that captured some ponies so he can turn them into dragons with a pulsating bag filled with a rainbow of darkness. You know, like the one you used to learn about in school. Seal Brown, Umber, Xanadu, Onyx, Navy Blue, Indigo, and Taupe. By the way, did you know that Spike was a bad guy at first? Or at least aligned with one? Uh, listen, Scorpion, can I go with you next time, huh? Can I? Can I? No, Spike! I can slither really fast, Scorpion! Really fast? Not now, Spike! T-Rack needed four dragons to cast a spell that would bring Eternal Night across the land. So why couldn't he use any of the hundreds of other dragons he seems to have? Yeah, I never played D&D, so I don't know what the difference is. Luckily, Megan and the ponies get a hold of their own magic rainbow from Father Mushroom here, because that sort of thing happens. Here, take and be healthy. At first, the rainbow doesn't seem to do anything, but then it pulls a Matrix Revolution and eats the rainbow of darkness from the inside, and then destroys T-Rack. That guy is deader than shit. <laughs> you won't see that on Care Bears. Then in the second special, the ponies are getting ready to have some sort of costume ball or whatever, when a bunch of them are kidnapped by Katrina, 
an evil sorceress who uses slave labor to feed her addiction for this magical brew. I see ecto cooler. <laughs> Funny thing is, she apparently wasn't always evil. And by the end of the special, she destroys her brew making device and reverts back to her old self. What beautiful, Katrina. Do you really think so, Doc? <laughs> Just like the good old days. You know, that sounds really interesting. You have this one character that's addicted to this, well, for lack of a better word, drug. We were at war at the time. Then you have this other character who obviously cares for her, but doesn't seem to know how to deal with the situation. I knew slaves. Thou shall I trap them. Oh, Katrina, you've grown so cold. Can we hear more about that backstory? Just a little flashback? Nothing? No one else would like to explore her descent into a mad obsession? Moondancer you? Oh, okay. I, I thought you had your hoof up. Alright. No. No one. You also had the TV show, which still had villains, although they were of slightly less caliber, as was the animation. I remember one that featured a crooked zebra and prince pony. No, not as in Prince of Ponies, just Prince Pony. I'm a talking little pony. Nightshade is my name. You say you'd like to meet me. He needs to work on his lip syncing. Like for starts, actually trying to move his lips. They were using his act as a front to steal shadows to feed a giant cloud monster. See what I see? A bunch of lovely shadows for the satchel and me. Aha! Ooh, there's more than just a few. I see some pony shadows plus a pair of humans too. Well, that's just silly. In keeping with the sentient elementals theme, there was this one with a giant lava monster that surfs on a freaking river of magma to capture these magical wands that control the magical balance for all of Equestria. Damn. I mean Ponyville. I mean Ponyland! Damn it, I knew I was going to do that. He uses the magic to make himself an indestructible diamond creature that... <laughs> oh... <laughs> and guest starring Steve Buscemi. He finds irony. But then he ends up being this second villain that the rainbow tears apart. Damn, these ponies are killers! Then there was some sort of goat wizard that had a donkey sidekick that sounded like Slimer. He was trying to kidnap the ponies because... I don't know. It was Tuesday. Actually, it's pretty creepy the way he did it. Whenever one of the unicorns tried to use their magic, they would be teleported to his castle in the realm of darkness. Hey, no fair! Baby Ribbon winked out! Baby Ribbon, you know winking out is against the rules. Wait a minute, it's called winking? Twilight, is that what you've been doing this whole time? Winking out? <laughs> um, yes. Ah, uh, 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 now you just ruined it. She has such trouble winking back in. Stop calling it that! Of course, not all the villains could be menacing. In one episode, you had this vain evil pig that was trying to turn all of Ponyville into glass so she could see her reflection all the time. But that turned out to be a ploy by these guys. They acted like her minions until she turned all of Ponyland into glass because they wanted to rule their own kingdom. ISCR for familiar faces, uh, for that guy with the glasses, dot com. Um, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but is your species known for sleeping on glass? Are they known for eating glass? No? Well, then I have to ask you a question. Why are you trying to turn everything into glass? Anyway, they needed the pony's hair to weave a magical cloak so the pig could cast her glass spells. Everybody got that? What the? This is incredible. We could have told you that. Yeesh, that was gross. Do it again. Of course, when most people think of My Little Pony villains, they think of the witches from the My Little Pony movie. A clunker of a film with Danny DeVito with the head building for some reason. But you know, I gotta say, he looked good back then. 
And yes, the only redeeming factors of this movie are its villains, who are actually kind of the stars of the picture. At least these two. They're the ones that have to overcome the odds and work together to reach their goals. Sure, they ultimately fail because they're the bad guys, but all the ponies really do in the movie is run around and promote another set of toys. And of course, this is the introduction to the grand mac daddy of all pony villains, the Schmooze. A giant multi-faced Lovecraftian whore that devours Ponyland by covering it with its viscous body. Oh, and if you come in contact with it, it gives you a bad attitude. Mood slime. Oh, baby. So that's pretty much the highlights of G1. Cutesy-wootsy, but good villains. And really, it wasn't any more vapid or preachy than Care Bears or Captain Planet. By the way, none of the villains were ever turned into toys. Because, you know, little girls don't like conflict. You'll bust my head? Yep, right off. I like that flower.